Um, uh, well, welcome everyone. Uh, with this recording's just started, so this is day one. We've um, decided to split our back to school event this year over two days. So there's today, which are at now, and again on Monday. If you're game for it, I'm going to try and leave you a little bit of homework to do over the weekend. It's not compulsory, so if you don't want to do it, you don't have to. But it would be great if you do, because that will give us more to talk about on Monday afternoon. Um, Kimberly, you are kind of the senior figure here. Kimberly is actually um, very much senior to the stuff that Darren and I are doing. And, um, and of course, there's Steve over in New Zealand. Um, did you want to say anything to welcome folks this afternoon? Um, I'm not sure I'm a senior because of my age. I did like that my um, five-year-old son was putting his hand up, as you said, um, that as well. I think he maybe has something to say. Um, no, I do um, just will acknowledge that um, we are incredibly grateful for um, you, all of our wonderful users of our tools, because uh, we only get to do what we do because you use our products. Um, and, um, you know, Chris and I in particular have been doing this and working with teachers for uh, well over a decade now, and I will tell you that without any exaggeration, every time we work with teachers, we learn something new, um, because even though we use our products and we think we use them extensively, uh, it is quite amazing uh, the way that teachers are creative and resilient and entrepreneurial in their approach to um, the way that technology can actually enhance learning. So um, thank you for everything that you do in that regard. Um, and um, thank you for choosing to give up some of your time and spend it with us today, whether you're watching live or um, watching the recording. And um, we're always grateful. We know you have a bazillion things approximately that you could be doing um, in preparation for the school year. And so we're grateful that you're choosing to spend some time with us uh, today and always. And as Chris said, please feel free to reach out to anybody on the team if we can ever um, be of service. Cool. All right, well, welcome back. It is not quite the start of the new school year yet, but it's close, and so, you know, welcome back to the new school year. I do remember those those days. I just thought I'd um, take a moment just to tell you, like, who registered for today, and, uh, you know, like I said, more people usually register for things than turn up. That's just how life is. Um, but we've got a lot of primary teachers here today. We've got a lot of secondary teachers, and then there's a smattering of other people involved in things like teacher training. We've got some people that work in both primary and secondary, some higher ed people. Uh, and so, yeah, it's a bit of a mixed bag, but primarily primary and secondary teachers. Uh, in terms of what roles are represented, most of you are in the classroom. Um, approximately half of you uh, that have registered are uh, classroom practitioners. We've got some curriculum directors and people at the, the sort of coordinator level. We've got some ICT coordinators. And of course, there's also some principals and leadership uh, as well. So just to let you know sort of who's in the room, um, and that's who we're going to try and uh, address to. The other interesting statistic when I started to look at who registered for today is, well, where people are coming from. It's primarily Australia. We've got quite a few people from over in New Zealand, so welcome to my Kiwi friends. Um, in terms of the types of schools, uh, most people here have identified as being in the public system, although we've got quite a few from the Catholic system and, of course, some independent schools as well. Interestingly, the school sizes that people work in, we've got a lot of people that work in that sort of 300 to 600 size school. Um, some people in some slightly bigger ones, but most people are in that sort of middle-sized school, that sort of 300, 600 kind of um, area. So I don't know what you do with that information. I just think it's interesting sometimes to look at where people uh, are from and what they do and that kind of thing. I'm going to hand over to my good friend Darren Macalino from South Australia, and Darren is going to talk to us a little bit about the teaching and learning cycle. And then I'm going to jump in after that and talk more about the lesson design cycle. And the, the goal of today is to just sort of stop and pause and think a little bit about, you know, rather than just sort of rush into the things we do every year where we, we go, oh, we have to teach this and we have to teach that. And the curriculum says we're going to do this bit. Like, let's just take a step back and start thinking about what the cycle looks like um, and and what we might be able to do to sort of, you know, enrich in that. Enrich in? Is that a word? I don't know. Over to you, Darren. Thanks, Betcha. Hi, everybody. My name's Darren. If you haven't met me before, I'm semi-new here. Uh, started last year as a customer success manager in the team, so it's awesome working with these guys. And hopefully today, as uh, as Chris mentioned, you get something out of it. Really hoping that uh, we can sort of start looking at sort of the teaching and learning cycle and then sort of pull out some really interesting ideas in some breakout rooms 
um, around what you guys do, you know, in terms of your practice in the in the classroom, and then start to refine that and look at how that works in terms of some different ways to model it and to look at the actual integration because we all have technology. That's why we're here, um, but it's how we use it that makes the difference. So we might uh, flick forward. Thanks, Mitch. I'm, I'm trying to uh, find the button to give you slide control, but I can't quite see it. So just tell me when you need to change the slides. Easy. I don't have many slides, so we're, we're all good. We're all good. So uh, this is a teaching learning cycle that we've adapted from actually uh, New South Wales um, public education. And sort of looking around at all these different ones, I really liked just the simplicity um, of this one here. And hopefully, you know, it resonates for a lot of you guys in terms of, of what you're doing, starting often as we do as uh, educators. And, you know, I used to teach high school science. So I, I remember going through a very similar process uh, as this, you know, starting with your kind of your analysis and your decision making around, you know, where are my students now? You know, you you, you need to know and have an understanding, I think, of, of what they know and, and what they're capable of. And putting that into your design and then moving into sort of that planning and that programming phase and understanding, you know, what do I, I want my students to learn at the end of the day? You know, that's our curriculum, that's understanding the purpose of, uh, of why we're in the classroom and, and how we're trying to get uh, the most out of our students through to then the classroom practice. So what am I actually doing? You know, how will my students get there um, and progress in their learning? It's sort of tying up the cycle then again with you know, assessment feedback and our reporting about how you know when your students have got there in terms of the learning that you are planning. So it's a very high level teaching and learning cycle, um, this particular one and, and some of the other ones that uh, Chris will take you through, uh, get a little bit more uh, sort of in the weeds a little bit. But I like this idea of, you know, it's a standard cycle that we're going through. And it doesn't mean that you're always starting at one point and making your way neatly through. And I think uh, we'll allude to that later. It's very rarely ever that simple. Um, but at, at kind of a higher level, you know, these are the different sort of stages often um, that as educators uh, uh, we're in. So what I wanted to kind of pull out is a few different ideas around in each of these stages, what are some of the tools and technologies or, or strategies and activities. So to give you an idea, we might flick to the next one, Betch. Mm -hmm. This is sort of maybe one way um, that you can think in terms of the real practicalities of what makes a difference to saving yourselves time, um, you know, boosting classroom engagement and the like. So first example there is uh, in the planning and the programming stage. So scheduling learning tasks um, on Google Classroom with uh, groups that are pre-assigned. So if you don't know, you can obviously post uh, assignments or, or resources and you can post it, you get your drop down list of students and you can post it to individual students that you choose. So you can actually set those as um, either a draft or you can even schedule a post in advance. So theoretically, if you know your your uh, lesson is uh, at 9 a.m. On a, on a Monday morning, guarantee that uh, 9 p.m. on Sunday night is when everything will be coming together. Uh, but you can schedule for 9 a.m. for, you know, let's say you've got 10 different groups of students in your class, 10 different uh, posts on your Google Classroom for 9 a.m. Boom, they're there. Each group has their own resource, which, you know, might be customized. So that's sort of one kind of example of, of where that could go. Classroom practice um, using Docs voice typing to keep notes during a, a thinking routine. Um, uh, hopefully people know about thinking routines, maybe throw us a, a thumbs up or, a, or a, a clap if you've heard of the thinking routines before. Um, really love thinking routines as a, as a teacher. So a, a good example is a thinking routine of what makes you say that, which is you know, pretty much a, a questioning uh, routine where you're continually saying students, you know, I like the way you're thinking about that. We're having like a Socrative discussion, you know, what makes you say that? To have those discussions effectively, it's pretty hard if you're typing away furiously or even for the students if they're trying to type um, for notes. But you could have you know, voice typing in the background that could capture that entire conversation to, uh, to make that more seamless. And the, the final one is uh, an example We're using our practice sets um, built into Google Classroom for those who have a, a paid edition of, uh, of Workspace. Um, you might be able to use that to find and resolve misconceptions during real time which I think is, is actually quite a game changer. So you can have a practice set for whatever topic that you're teaching. And in real time, as the students are filling out in, uh, in the practice set on Google Classroom, it'll collate those results and say, you know, a lot of students are struggling with questions three and questions five. So you can bring the class to attention and go, all right, I'm noticing everybody question five, no one's getting it. 
let's sit back and let's have a chat about that. So using this kind of teaching and learning cycle framework, wanted to uh, get us into some some breakout groups. So I might get Betcha to start prepping those breakout groups. All, if you all can. set. All and, set. And if we flick to the next slide, yeah. here's what I'm thinking. Give us, what do you guys think, maybe about 10 minutes yep, or I'll so? Set I'll set it for 12 minutes. It gives a little bit of buffer. 12's good, I think. I think 12's good. So let's give you guys 12 minutes um, in some breakout groups. And what I'd love you to do is share some useful ideas that fit into those different stages of the cycle. Um, now, if you haven't taken notes, I might be able to send that cycle through. Um, but if you want to flick back real quick, Betch, just so everyone can quickly jot down the four different stages. Yeah. So you got your analysis for decision making, where are your students, planning and programming, classroom practice, and essentially assessment. So if you want to jot those four down, then we should be good to go. So what you're saying, Darren, is you want people to think about, like, say, that analysis for decision making. What things do they do to to do that? Like, what techniques? Absolutely. So if you flick forward you? again, the, yeah. the examples that I gave were very practical examples that are more kind of technology focused, so apps and features. Um, but I definitely want to throw in strategies and activities in there as well. So if you've got a really specific strategy, like that thinking routine, um, that was a strategy. Yeah. Or if you have a specific activity, which might be, you know, more specifically around how you group students or the way that you get them to do something. If it fits in and it, you think it's sort of like your absolute gold nugget, let's all share our gold nuggets in the next 12 minutes um, that fit into those different ones. And then we might come back and share and hopefully we all uh, we all get to, to share some collective wisdom and we can we can bounce off that. All right, so I'm going to throw people into the breakout rooms now. Uh, this this meetout will stop. You'll get thrown into another one. Uh, it'll be there for about uh, well 12 minutes, and you'll, there'll be a timer at the top. And when the time is finished, it'll bring you back to the main room. So everyone ready? Everyone ready to hyperspace transport? What they call it teleport. Here we go. All right, thanks guys. Hopefully you're all back. Um, as always, we apologise for what inevitably is that jarring experience when you're not keeping track of the timer counting down, and someone gets cut off right at the end there but hopefully uh that was that was valuable and useful for you guys um i'd love to get some some sharing going we might flick to the next slide bitch i think i have a fantastic um so if you want to use the raise your hand feature if anyone would like to share some of the standard ideas and it could be yours it could be someone else's in your group if you want to attribute it to them the floor is open who would like to to kick us off let's go with paul thanks paul Are you on mute? Where are you, Paul? Paul's down there. Just uh, hit your unmute, the uh, un microphone unmute button, Paul. Yep, no, maybe. All right, just while we're waiting for Paul, is there anyone else who'd like to share anything they talked about? By the way, I popped into a couple of rooms and I thought it was amazing to get teachers who aren't normally talking to each other, like from different systems, different age groups, different states, and just putting them all in the same place at the same time. That's just interesting just in itself. Um, so yeah, anyone else want to just... Uh, Donna, I think Donna. Donna. I know what it's like when nobody wants to share back. Um, we had a really <laughs> great discussion and Leanne shared some really awesome ideas of things that she does, um, talked about using um, rubrics so that uh, the learning intentions and the success criteria drive where the outcomes are, using practice sets to check understanding, uh, creating differentiated tasks according to what the students know, so finding out what they know and then they get differentiated tasks depending on where they need to go to for next steps. Lots of different ways for collecting student voice. Um, thing there was somebody sorry apologies for forgetting your name but it's the end of the day here in nz talked about using the question or the poll feature in google classroom for a really quick check-in just a pulse check with kids um so yeah lots of really cool ideas that's amazing thank you so much donna anybody else that would like to share and just before while you're thinking about sharing i'll uh, i'll just say a couple things around i understand there's actually quite a few people who are at different uh, level so in my group there was some uh, some some newbies or people that are really just sort of starting on their technology journey that is fine please don't be intimidated by our discussions here just think of it as a little buffet just have a little taste and, and have a little uh, see what you can you can take out um from what you've got so ryan 
let's go to Ryan. Um, thanks. Yeah, we um, in our group, we we talked about tech and tools and everything like that. But we also talked about um, the fact it's really important to kind of circle back and like, like, like the cycle kind of indicates that you think they know it and then you find out they don't and kind of like getting pulled out of a breakout room. There's that jarring moment where you realize everything is different and you're now over here when you thought you were here. Um, so, you know, gathering that information before you start all this lesson, but then remembering that it's a constant and ongoing sort of process as well. Absolutely. The, the cycle part of the cycle. Thank you so much. To finish off this little section, what we might do is 30 seconds, spam the chat, put in your favorite one that you heard or your favorite thing, and this will hopefully hold us in good stead for the next section as we go into it. So 30 seconds, go in the chat. What did you love to to hear what were some cool ideas playing sudoku very cool oh, dominic um <laughs> I, I did see that uh oh who was it um someone just had their hand up it was paul but someone else had their hand up i know i've lost it i pulled their hand out it's all right google forms form assessment absolutely gutman charts interesting i've heard of gutman charts before archive classes yes is it gutman or gutman I have to Google that. Accessibility, sticky for slides and docs. Yep, absolutely. Physical continuums, yes. Forms and jam boards, RIP for quick and fun check-ins. Um, Google Sheets, yep. Zone of proximal development groupings within a class, absolutely. Um, I think they're very much underrated. Really had a great idea for students creating Google Slides about themselves, which led to an inter interesting unit. Fantastic, Gutman as well. Brilliant, all right. Look, keep those ideas coming. Uh, let's keep putting them in the chat as we move into the next session. So I will hand back to Chris. All right. Thanks, Daz. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to dive a little bit deeper. Like that was very much at the sort of the top level. And uh, although Darren calls my session the bit that's in the weeds, I think this is an important bit too. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about the lesson design cycle. And that is like when you start to think about, okay, you kind of know what you've got to teach. You've, you've figured out where the kids are. You've figured out what you've got to teach. How do you go about designing something that's worth doing? And I use the term designing really deliberately because I think, you know, you can think that the learning journey is straightforward. And in its simplest terms, teaching is really about, you know, figuring out where kids are, where they need to be, and how do I get them there, you know? And it's straight, it's straightforward, right? But of course, it's except when it's not. Like that's actually more like what most learning journeys look like. Am I right? Right? It's that yeah, things don't work, and things, and then, and, and but then add another layer of complexity because then you've got this differentiation stuff where some kids aren't following the path you intended them to follow, and and pretty soon teaching is actually way more complex than you know. I think a lot of people outside of teaching think it is. Uh, you know. Um, but you know, it's it's a very complex thing, um, and there's really a simple solution. But I want to just this is a model that um, our friend Chris Hart. I know many of you know Chris Hart. Um, Chris, I, I learned this from Chris Hart. I think it's a really great model to hang off. And I've looked at other teaching and uh, uh, learning design models, and they all basically map back to something like this anyway. So you know, you've probably seen other things. I'm going to use this one as an example. I think, you know, before you can start designing learning for students, first of all, you've got to start with those relationships, figure out who the kids are. What's the big picture? What's the collaborative practices? Who can you work with? Um, and what are the big questions you want to actually embed inside a lesson or a series of lessons? Then you build the learning in phases. You know, you, you can't jump a chasm in one in, well, you can't jump a chasm in two steps. It's the same, you know. So you build the learning in phases and you, you figure out how you get to the next bit, to the next bit, to the next bit. Um, differentiation, obviously, you've got to think about who those kids are in your class. And you can't do that unless you know who they are. So um, I know in the group that we were talking about, you know, one of the, in the breakout session, um, one of the things that came up was like just getting to know your kids, using that time at the beginning of the school year just to build the relationships, to figure out who's who and what they like and what they're into and what they don't like. Um, because that will help inform the design process of what you're doing with them. And then something that I love doing when I teach is this use of um, things like primary sources and models and visualizations and raw data. I'd rather give kids raw data and ask some questions about it than have them just learn a bunch of facts, right? I'd, I want to spark their curiosity and their engagement with the world. So this cycle that I want to talk about, it starts for me, it starts with a hook. It starts with what can I do to grab the kids' attention? 
And whether that's showing them a video or a, um, sharing a really interesting article that you've read or maybe showing them something that they didn't expect or, you know, if they're little kids, you can bring an animal into the class or if they're big kids, you can do something else. But start with something that gets their attention somehow. We'll unpack some of these as we go along. Then, of course, you've got to have a clear idea of the overview and the outcomes. You know, there's, there's no escaping that. Um, I know, you know, as much as we'd like to just be as creative as possible with what we teach, at the end of the day, sometimes we're just told the things we have to achieve. So we have to bear those in mind and make sure that the outcomes that we're trying to achieve and the, and the overview, that not only we're aware of that, but the students are aware of that as well. Um, then there is the input stage. And the input stage, I think, is where a lot of teachers, in my experience, that I've worked with a lot of teachers over the years, the input stage is where it seems a lot of them get stuck because they spend a lot of time just giving input, telling the kids stuff, showing the kids stuff, like just input, input, input from the teacher to the student. And I think the problem that sometimes too much input does is it doesn't allow for the fact that kids have to construct something. They have to do something physically. And I'll... I'll, I'll I'll expand that in just a sec. But this idea of doing, whenever I worked with teachers, my role in a, my life before Google was working in a school as a technology integrator. So I would go from class to class to class, work with teachers and say, what do you what do you need to teach this term? And they'd tell me, we got, we're doing a topic on this or that. And I'd say, okay, what are the kids going to do? Well, I'm going to show them this and I'm going to explain that. No, no, no. What are they going to do? Right? Because unless they're doing something, making something, then we're missing this really important part of the cycle called construction. Right? Um, then there's what I've called demo. How does what they've done demonstrate the knowledge that meets the outcomes? So, uh, you know, it, it's all very well to get them to make something or do something, but if it doesn't demonstrate the skills, and I'm sure we've all seen that, we've all asked kids to do something and, you know, they've made some beautiful poster or I've done something, but then you ask them a question about it and they, they actually don't know any of the actual knowledge you were hoping they'd know. You know, they've made something pretty, but they haven't actually learnt much. Uh, so whatever you do has to demonstrate the knowledge. And then, of course, there's the reflection cycle where you look back and you go, what would I change? What would I do different? And you sort of go around the cycle again. So that's kind of what I think of as the sort of the cycle, right? Um, and let's unpack a couple of things there. So this part about the hook, I think it's such an important thing. I, I, I've walked into so many classes over the years where the teacher will go in and just like literally just start doing their thing, you know, whether that's opening the textbook or whether it's just starting talking to the kids. They don't really try and do anything to hook the kids' attention. Um, and those that hook can be anything, anything at all to get the kids' attention. What you want to do is inspire awe, wonder, curiosity, surprise. You're trying to get them to want to know more. Um, and And... Kids are curious, naturally. Um, we try our best to beat it out of them sometimes, but they are generally pretty curious um, if we let them be. So, you know, whether it's a story or a video or just uh, an article you found or a news report or just some data that you can present to them that gets them to say, hey, why is it like that? Right? Conversation starters, that's what you want. Now, I've listed on the side there a couple of um, mainly Google resources. There's a couple of semi-related Google resources there. But I don't know if you're aware of these or not, but I've always found these amazing conversation starters. And you know, if you follow our Learn with Google webinars that we do every month, we've, you know, we've unpacked a lot of these in our monthly webinars. So I'm not going to do too much of a deep dive into any of these today, but you know, things like Google Earth, for example, to be able to go and visit anywhere in the world and look at it and like drop yourself into it into a a 360 degree photo or you know view a mountain range or dive down into an island somewhere um, the sorts of questions and ponderings and things you can trigger from being able to do something in google earth uh, it is an astounding resource um, and one that i don't think teachers make enough use of to be perfectly honest um, then there's the arts and culture project or arts and culture at uh, google.com arts and culture is this massive database of cultural artifacts. There's literally millions of artifacts in there from paintings and artworks to sculptures to museum pieces to historical stories to biographies about famous people. There is just, you name it, you can probably find it in arts and culture. Um, so again, we've we've unpacked this in some other webinars we've done. So um, if you have never seen arts and culture, 
uh, it always does amaze me when I say to a lot of teachers, oh, arts and culture, and they go, I've never heard of that, right? Please check it out. It's um, one of the most amazing resources. There's a couple of others there as well. Gapminder, if you've never seen Gapminder, it's not a Google project, but it is um, uh, a tool that was developed with Google, uh, and it's related to the one under it, the public data.google.com, um, where you can actually browse through data sets and you can do things like look at different countries in the world and look at different aspects of their population growth or their, you know, mortality rates or whatever it is. So if you were, say, a, I don't know, a geography teacher or a history teacher and you're trying to understand different aspects of how the world works together, you can look at it with real data and start to really analyse stuff. Um, there's another part of Gapminder there called Money Street. If you go into gapminder.org, you'll see there's a tab in there called Money Street. Um, which lets you pick any aspect of life, be it sort of uh, toys or toilets or classrooms or homes or you know, kitchen tables, whatever it is, and it will show you each of those objects from everywhere in the world. So, for example, say you pick toys, it will show you what a toy is like in Uganda versus Canada versus, you know, Brazil. Um, and that's really interesting conversation starts for kids to start thinking about that stuff. Um, the newspaper archive there, news.google.com slash newspapers, the newspaper archive is like a century and a half of digitised newspapers that you can go back and read. They're literal scans of newspapers that date back to the mid-1800s um, from all around the world. So, again, real data. Get Instead of talking about you know, know, the moon landing, like go and look at the newspaper that was reported the day of the moon landing. Right? There's a whole bunch of um, ways you can use uh, that raw data. And the last one there, I threw it in there because it's honestly, it's one of my favorite things and nobody even knows about it. It's called the Constitute Project. It's a, it's a site that Google helped build when we didn't, it's not our site, but we contributed to the, uh, the data behind it, um, where you can look up the information in any constitution in the world, right? Not only can you look up a constitution, of a country, but you can take two countries and look at their constitution side by side, and you can pick a particular aspect. So maybe you're looking at, you know, religious freedom, let's say, and you can pick two countries and you can you can compare what one constitution says about that topic right next to what another one says. Amazing conversation starters. So that's just a, a bunch of tools there that I thought, um, you know, if you're not aware of, uh, do check them out. Um, we'll make these. Uh, slides available later, so you know, if, you, if you haven't written them down, that's fine, but um, I'm sure I can see a lot of people sort of taking notes there. I want to come back to this idea that learning is about doing things, because if you go to your, uh, well, I, I went to the Australian curriculum, which I'm sure um, many people in this room are familiar with, and uh, to my Kiwi friends, oh, I'm sorry, but you would have something similar, I'm sure. Every um, curriculum around the world I've ever looked at always starts with a verb and if you start to look at that compare understand create make represent investigate construct publish justify all of those words they're all verbs they're all doing words so there's an expectation that when we teach something to kids we actually want them to do something and i'm probably preaching the converted here because I'm, I'm i'm sure many of you are amazing teachers who who this sounds like i'm just telling you something you already know but it is astounding when you walk into random classrooms around the world, how many people, their kids are not doing something. They're, they're passively absorbing information without actually doing anything with that information. Um, and you know, it's just something to bear in mind that you know, not only should they be doing it pedagogically, but like we're supposed to do it. That's what the curriculum says we're supposed to do anyway. We're supposed to make things and do things, and design things. Um, Richard, just to sorry to interject, um, we lost your camera. Oh, did you? Yeah, I mean, your voice is like, you know, melodious and captivating, <laughs> but you know, it's just an element ah of okay. engagement that okay. we're missing yeah. when we can't see the face expressions. Um, All right, okay, there you go. Back. Um, 
Now, I'm going to put this up here. This is, again, from uh, our friend Chris Hart, and he worked with Summer Howarth, who I'm sure some of you know. Um, they did some work back in 2021 where they were looking at learning variables, and they particularly uh, did this research in terms of uh, hybrid learning because 2021, if you recall, was kind of the height of the, uh, the whole um, pandemic thing. But I think they hold true to thinking about the way we think about classrooms generally anyway. So I'm just going to list them. This was originally called hybrid variables. I've renamed it learning variables because I think it's just as valid whether you're in hybrid learning or not. And what um, Chris and and uh, sorry, Chris and Summer did was they identified a series of variables that you can consider while you're thinking about how you're constructing learning. And they narrowed it down to place, space, time, people, and power. And I was want to sort of unpack a little bit about how this works. If you think about a very traditional classroom, the place where the learning takes place is in the school. The space where it takes is analog, right? The time that it happens is when everybody's together. It's synchronous. The people who are involved are traditional. It's the teacher and the student. And the power in most of those situations resides with the teacher, right? That If you go to the left-hand side of that, um, that, that chart, that's a very traditional model of education. If we were to take all of the sliders, imagine this is like a graphic equalizer here, if we take all of those sliders and slide them to the right, we'd say, well, learning could take place at home. It could be entirely digital. It would be asynchronous when nobody's in the room at the same time. It would be not just the teacher, but it would be like learning from experts and individuals and going to museums and stuff. Um, and the power would reside with the learner, right? That would be a very, I guess, super progressive approach to um, education. The reality is, of course, that it's neither of those extremes. So I think when you're starting to think about how you're designing learning, it's worth considering that there are variables. And if you imagine each of those blue bars as being like a slider on a on like a graphic equalizer and saying, OK, if I was designing learning, where would I slide the slider to between school and home? Where would I want most of my learning to take place? Now, in a school situation, maybe most of it is down the school end. But I'm sure, you know, if you're setting assignments for kids to do outside of school hours or if you still set homework or if you're taking field trips or something, maybe the place is not always at the school. Maybe the space that they work in is not always analog. It's not always digital. Maybe it's somewhere in the middle. Um, I, I used to teach technology. So for me, my slider was up towards the digital end. Yours may or may not be, right? But my point is, it's worth acknowledging that these four or five variables exist and then consciously deciding where you want to put these sliders, right? Rather than just accepting that, oh, I'm just going to do it that way because it's the way I've always done it, right? Should your learning be synchronous or asynchronous? Should we all be learning together at the same time? Should we all be doing our own thing individually? I had a year 11 class one time which didn't really fit on the timetable. So I just said to the kids, we're going to check in twice a term and the rest of the time you're going to work on your own and just come and see me if you need me. That was almost entirely asynchronous. It was very untraditional for, for the school, right? But it was an option. Um, in terms of who, is it the traditional people, like it's the teacher and student, or do we start to bring in things like people from the ecosystem? Do we invite experts in from outside of the school? Do we do video calls out to experts? Do we take the kids on field trips? Do we, do we use AI? as a potential inputter to the learning process, right? So there's some things to think about there. And then finally, that power one, who has the power in the classroom? Is it just the teacher? Is it the teacher standing out the front going, you will do as I say? Or is it the kids running their own game? Or is it somewhere in the middle, right? Again, these are just five variables for you to think about how, if I had to set my sliders, what's my slider arrangement look like? Because I'm sure it would be different for every person in this call. Does that make sense? Okay, um, I'm just going to go to this next one. I, I threw this in because I just want, I know many of you use Google Classroom. Um, you know, you're attending a Google event, so I'm sure many people use Google. Uh, my Google Home is thinking I'm talking to it. Um, so what I've done here, I've just taken uh, the yellow boxes, which is kind of what I would consider a reasonably, you know, traditional or standard kind of workflow that happens in the classroom. You know, if you think about most things we do in a classroom, however we might design the learning, at the end of the day, you know, you're going to ask the kids to do something. You assign some work for the students. They do the work. You give them some feedback on the work. 
they submit it, you grade it, you return it, and they get their feedback, right? That's at the very bottom basic, you know, lower level. That's kind of what happens in most classrooms. And you can dress it up all sorts of fancy ways, but that's really what happens. What I've done there with the yellow bits is outline what I think a sort of a teaching process looks like. And with the green bits, I've tried to overlay all the different parts within Google Classroom that support those processes. So for example, if you're the teacher assigning work, well, some of the tools you've got to help you in that process is, you know, there's some classroom add-ons inside Google Classroom that you could use to sort of embed other things. Uh, you could set a rubric in advance so students are you know, more aware of what they're supposed to do. Um, while they're in that production phase, as I call it, where the student's doing the work and going through those feedback cycles before they submit, you've got things like read-along to help students you know, with, with reading levels. You've got practice sets and YouTube interactive quizzes that you can use to help within that sort of learning feedback cycle stage. In terms of providing feedback, you know, there are so many ways inside Google Classroom to provide feedback to students. I don't think sometimes um, we all realize just you can leave private comments, to individual students, class comments to the class, in document comments by selecting a piece of work in a document and attaching a, a comment directly to that thing that the student wrote. Or you can, you know, have a, a video call with students, either individually or in groups or the whole class to try and provide feedback. So there's lots of feedback options there. Um, you know, once they attach the work, you've got things like originality checks that they can check their own work for plagiarism or similarity um, to things that exist out there on uh, outside of the school or inside of the school. Um, and and you know, you come back when the teacher returns the work. You've got again, you've got lots of opportunities for feedback and comments and things for for doing that. So I just I just thought that was interesting when you start to think about, well, the yellow bits are the things we got to do anyway, and the green bits are the bits that Google Classroom supports, I think, really well. Um, so, you know, often I think, I think there was a perception that when we went into the pandemic phase, and I, I reckon if I asked this room how many of you started using Google Classroom during the pandemic, I reckon it'd probably be at least half of you, right? But the, the fact is Google Classroom was, uh, invented and designed and released a good five or six years prior to any pandemics. So it was not designed as a pandemic saviour. It was designed as a day-to-day -day classroom tool for teachers to do their work, right? The fact that it worked really well in a pandemic, uh, that was a nice byproduct, but that wasn't why we made it. We made it to help teachers on a day-to-day -day basis when we're not in emergency learning. Um, and hopefully that diagram just gives you a bit of an overview of like why we think it's a good tool to use, not just for emergency teaching, but just like regularly. So I just want to come back to that, um, you know, that, that sort of thing there, just to remind you again, that's what we just so, you know, start with a hook, make sure the outcomes are clear, give the kids some input. So yes, they, they can't invent stuff out of nothing. You need to give them information, whether that's showing them things, telling them things, talking about things, class discussions, whatever it is, they need some input. They can't do something with nothing, but then they need to do something to make something. And I suppose as you go through this school year, what I'm going to, my challenge to you is, you know, go and look at your teaching programs. Do they, in fact, ask students to do things? And at what level are you asking them to do things? Okay, now I'm going to unpack this and ask you this question, what do you think effective teaching and learning looks like in a technology enabled classroom? So I've been doing a lot of talking, I'm gonna open it to you guys. So uh, I'm gonna ask if you'd like to contribute uh, just a, a, a sentence or two as, a, as an answer to that question. Um, put your hand up and I'll get you to unmute your microphone. And I'm interested in your thoughts. What do you think effective teaching looks like <coughs> in an enabled classroom? DJ, hi Dom. Um, hey, mate, how are you? I'm oh, very good. Um, I would suggest uh, it's a classroom where effectively I've made myself superfluous. Okay. So you want to push that slider all the way to the other side. I like it. They've got the learning. The, the learning's been set up. I've said go, and I've stepped out of the learning circle. Right. And you become like the, the facilitator or the guide or the... Yeah. I'm just on the side. The if they need me, I'm there. But they've yeah. got enough that they are confident enough that they can move forward. Lovely. Thanks, mate. Appreciate that. 
and I'm, I'm just going to come to Paul and Alfina in just a sec, but I just want to, I was throwing one other thing in here and I, I just real quick, um, I was, it was several years ago, I suppose, but I was invited to come to a school to look at what they were touting as an amazing technology enabled classroom. And I went, oh, I'm excited to see this. And I turned up at the school and I walked past the, they had big glass windows on the classrooms. And as I walked down the aisle of the, uh, the, 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 you know, the corridors in the school, I'm looking into these classrooms at these richly technology enabled classrooms to see a bunch of kids sitting there typing notes of what was on the board. And that was the school promoting this idea of a technology enabled classroom. And I thought that kind of missed the point of what we can do with technology. So again, sorry, didn't mean to interrupt, but I'll throw it back to you. What does effective teaching and learning look like? Um, Alfina. Um, okay, so for me, it's all about, for those who know, the same R model. And if you're just substituting a screen instead of writing notes with your finger, with so with your pencil, you're using typing, that substitution, very low level. So it needs to be back to what you said, Chris, about the verbs they're doing. How are they redefining learning um, and using that knowledge? I mean, kids can go watch a YouTube clip and figure out how to do something. If they're just regurgitating information, there's no point. They have to be able to physically transform and redefine what they're doing with, with, with their knowledge um, and creating new things and reaching out beyond their classroom and beyond their environment, whether or not it's another school, whether or not it's an expert. Um, and the, also using technology to help them better themselves with their learning. So um, I spoke about in the breakout rooms a lot about accessibility and how technology, even the brightest kid um, in one of my classes uses the text help read write toolbar, high EA or D kid, but extremely bright, but uses the dictionary extensively to help him with his learning. Um, so using those tools in a way that supports learning and then helps them take it beyond um what they're currently doing yep 100 percent. i'm glad you mentioned Sammer because i'm gonna i might go i might circle back to that in just a sec <laughs> um uh, leanne um just to add to what afina just said even you know being able to capture student voice to capture student understandings and reflections on learning um being able to you know to screencast and to show how they've understood um, a piece of assessment or, uh, you know, or the processes that they've gone through, or they're thinking behind um, their learning. So um, it's that that window into their thinking and their understanding. I think that's really crucial also to add to what was just said. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. Well done. Uh, and Paul, you also have your hand up. Um, someone said a good classroom is when everyone's doing the right thing, but it, no one mentioned engagement. You're going to have a whole room full of kids on the computer, but if they're not engaged, it's a waste of time. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I would also challenge you, though, and say it's more than just engagement, because watching TV is engaging. Oh, like, true. Yeah, so it's engaged, engaged but it's, it's more than that as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, Dom? It just occurred to me, there's noise. <laughs> it's funny you should say that. I'm like, it's, it's the noise of learning. A principal walked in my classroom one time and the kid just happened to be all quiet. And he looked in the door and he went, oh, Mr. Betcher, it's good to see so much great learning taking place here. And I went, I don't think they're doing much learning at all right now. They just happen to be quiet. But yeah, interesting. Like noise is a good thing. Um, and Ryan. Yeah, thanks. Um, like they can, depending on the students, it can look any number of ways. But I think one of the, the harder things for me is getting the point across that staring at a screen isn't passive like it used to be. It doesn't right, have yeah. to be this passive learning experience. If everybody's quiet and looking at a screen, it used to mean they were just looking, you know, Sam R. We substituted a worksheet with a screen. Right. But now they can be completely redefining the whole project and thinking through critical puzzles and everything. So yeah the 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 shift from from passive to active and that whole spectrum there is really interesting as well yeah thanks mate appreciate it uh, i'm going to move on because two of you have mentioned sama sama or however you want to pronounce it um can i just have a thumbs up from people and using the icons at the bottom of the screen here uh if you've heard of the sama model 
Okay, a lot of people have, a lot of, a lot of little splitting thumbnails. Awesome, thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, unpack this a little bit because I've found from, again, lots of conversations with teachers, I think a lot of people kind of understand it. They kind of get what it's about, what they're supposed to do. But as you move up into those higher levels of modification and redefinitions, there's a lot of confusion about what it actually looks like. So I just want to unpack a little bit of that for you and hopefully help you weave some of that into your planning for this year. So um, the SAMA model was a model invented uh, by a guy called Ruben Pentadura in Maine in the US quite a few years ago um, when Maine was the first state in the US to go completely one-to-one -one, um, uh, laptops. Uh, and so they did a lot of thinking about what learning should look like when you inject technology into a classroom. And this was one of the models they came up with. It's not perfect by any means, but it's a good starting point. It's a nice, simple model to start thinking about this. And what it says is basically, if you introduce technology into a classroom, if you just substitute things you were doing with tech, then that's called substitution. If you make it a little bit better with the tech, that's augmentation. If you start to truly change the things you do in a classroom, that's modification. And if you redefine things, you start to do things you actually couldn't do previously. They were inconceivable without technology. So that's kind of the rub of it. Uh, again, there's just another simple sort of um, same thing, but just a, another version of saying it, um, substituting the old way of doing things, making small improvements, same task, but with significant improvements or creating completely new rich and novel tasks. Okay, so that's kind of the, the SAM model. A lot of you gave me a thumbs up, so I'm hoping that you know, there's a bit of an understanding about SAMA in this room. So I want to give you some examples. So example one might be, imagine uh, the original assignment, the thing that the teacher used to do was to do a project about a country where the, cons the, where the thing the student produced was consisting handwritten content with compiled cut and paste magazine clippings. Have put your, wave at me or put your hand up if you've ever seen a teacher do something like that, or if you've ever been the recipient work like that. <laughs> Kill me now. Yes. Okay, we've all done it, right? And probably all did it when we were at school. And I'm sure there are still schools where they still do this sort of stuff. There's nothing inherently bad in that. But if you were to introduce technology into that classroom, what would it start to look like? So I'm going to give you a few different possibilities. So first of all, substitution would be saying, let's use some presentation software like Google Slides, and let's construct a presentation with information about a selected country. Whoop de doo, right? We've we've all we've done is take what was on a piece of cardboard and turned it onto a piece of digital, you know, canvas. Other than that, I like pedagogically, there's really no real change. Okay. Then you go, okay, so what about if we start to incorporate some multimedia? So maybe we put in some audio and some video and we could hyperlink out to other resources to give it more depth and provide, you know, more engagement. Well, that's better. That's better, but you know, I think we can do better than that. So that's augmentation. You start to get into, say, a, a, mod a, a modification stage. Maybe you could do something like create a travel brochure and then incorporate some multimedia, maybe get the students to create the audio and video rather than just find something on YouTube. So maybe the students are creating the audio and video, making it into a travel brochure and sort of taking, again, it's the same idea. We're still learning about a country. We're still gathering that information to sort of, you know, understand what it's like to live in another place, but we're doing it in a slightly richer way. Or maybe we could take the redefinition thing. Maybe we could go and take a look around that country with Google Earth, first of all, and then maybe use Google Meet to connect with some schools that actually are in that country and maybe have a conversation across video calling so we can do that. And then interview some people who live there or who have visited the country and then produce a podcast, right? So... All of the stuff in black will achieve the stuff in blue, right? Being at the top, the original assignment, the goal, the aim of the thing, I'm assuming from that teacher who did that, was to help the students learn more about what it's like in another part of the world, right? But the ways we can do that using technology become richer and deeper. And I'm just these are just random examples that I've just come up with here. Obviously, there are lots and lots and many ways you could interpret this and lots of things you could come up with. Okay, but does that make sense? Like you start to think about how you enrich in this, that's that word again, right? Um, I'll give you another example. You know, we've all seen kids doing these sort of uh, sheets where they're coloring in the fractions, right? So the original assignment might have been show your understanding of fractions on a worksheet by coloring in the blocks. Well, what do we really want the kids to do? We wanted to show their understanding of fractions, right? Well, so let's let's 
take that and we say, okay, substituting that would be maybe they open a spreadsheet and they color in the blocks, you know, right click, make it green, right click, make it blue, right? Color in the blocks on a spreadsheet. Yeah, they're using technology, but not doing anything different to the worksheet. Maybe they could use a Google Sheet to let students color in the blocks and then have the teacher offer feedback in the comments. Okay, I guess that's a little bit better. They're giving some direct feedback. And I, I think be helpful, but it's still basically the same task. Or maybe they could check their understanding of more complex fractions by using practice sets, which then provide students with instant feedback from the AI and enable the teacher to spend more time helping students that need it. So that's a possibility of you know how technology can start to, you know, be even more useful here. Or maybe if we're getting into that sort of redefinitional thinking, maybe the students could use the Screencast app on their Chromebook to create a series of short videos to teach fractions to their peers. And if enough students did that over time, they'd form this collection of student created learning resources that they could use within the school as an ongoing basis, right? All of those things, again, all of those things, what they're doing is getting kids to show an understanding of fractions. But I hope you can see there's a big difference between the substitution level and the redefinition level, even though we're achieving the same goals, right? Now, there's an inherent thing in the background here that's, you know, again, something you hear from a lot of teachers, when you start to talk about introducing technology, they go, oh, I haven't got time for that. Because they see it as one more thing they need to do. And when you start to use technology in a classroom really effectively, what you're really doing is not adding one more thing, you're doing the things you always did, but just in a different, better, richer way, ideally, okay? So I have a little uh, task for you guys in the time we have left. I'm gonna throw you into breakout rooms again. Um, and before you do that, I need you to go to that address there. It's called bit.ly slash samasort. And I need you to open that up. Now, it is a shared slide deck. It is one slide deck that we will all be working in. So play nice. <laughs> Try not to trip over each other. Okay. So I'm going to get you all to get that. When I get that slide deck, and I'm just going to open it up and show you what it looks like. Okay. So it's the Samosort Challenge. And there is a bunch of slides in here that you'll see will open up. And they are multiple copies. So as you come in here, I'm going to get you to just now, you'll have to self-organize a little bit here, right? Because I couldn't think of a good way to sort of put you into groups. So just, you're all adults, just self-organize yourself into groups. What you're going to do when you get sort of three or four people onto a slide is you're going to go through this little stack of cards that I've got here. Each one of these cards describes an activity, right? So this first one, students use a PDF version of their math textbook and work through fraction problems one to 20 on page 12. What do you think? Substitution, modification, augmentation, or redefinition? Substitution. Substitution. Okay. I'm really okay at that. I'm with you on that. So I'm gonna move that over to this side. Okay, go to the next one. Watch a movie about inconvenient truth, write a reporting about climate change in Google Docs. Okay, whatever you think that is. I don't wanna leave the witness here. So I want you to get into groups. I want you to, three or four people on each slide. I'm gonna throw you into the breakout room so you can discuss it. I'll give you about, uh, probably about again, about 12, 15 minutes about to work on this. Okay, and uh, the, the best byproduct of this activity right here is the conversations you will have as you do this, because some of these are not clear cut, okay? All right, so I'm gonna throw in the breakout rooms now and I will, see. does everyone understand what they have to do? Okay, awesome. So I'm gonna throw you in the breakout rooms uh, and I will see you shortly. Hi, welcome back everyone. Um, I'm gonna present this window again. That one. So, how'd you go? Good discussions? Yes. Hmm. It is interesting. Someone once said to me, like, I can't quite describe to you what redefinition is, but I know it when I see it. And I, th I think there's an element of truth to that. Um, but we are going to try and figure out, like, how to describe it. Because my next question to you is, you know, what you've just spent the last 10 minutes looking at a bunch of random activities and trying to figure out where they would sit on a scale of, pretty basic substitution level stuff up to, wow, that's impressive. I never thought of doing it that way, redefinition stuff, okay? And 
we put them in four nice little boxes but you guys understand it's a continuum right there's no one way of doing it there's no right or wrong answers there's no you know hard boundaries between these things so i'm um, just mindful of time we're not going to have time to do this with a text block so i'm just going to ask you to sort of maybe just ponder this yourself and when you come back on monday we might unpack this just a little bit further i want you to start thinking about what makes a good m or r level activity so if you were to move in say you know and you saw in that diagram um you know when they draw the sama model if i go back to that sheet when they draw that they put that dotted line across the middle and that's a very deliberate dotted line because it divides it between the lower half, which is enhancing, and the top half, which is transforming, right? And there's been a whole bunch of research into this SAMA model that talks about, you know, when you go into that transformation stage, you actually start to see real improvement, okay? But let me just come back to that slide that I wanted, which is, where am I? Um, this one. Um, how do you know you like when you get into those higher levels what does it actually look like what what's the characteristics if i was sitting down to design the learning for my class this term term one 2024 and i look at my teaching program and i go hmm is this at the m and r level of sama what are the questions i'm going to ask myself so i'm going to propose to you just to speed this up i'm going to give you some things here that that you know talking to lots of teachers over the years, we've kind of agreed that this is kind of what the characteristics are. You tell me whether you agree with them or not. The first one, it's a rich task. It includes things like research, collaboration, time management, and so on. Yes or no? Yes. Yeah, okay. What And, and the thumbs are a good thing here. So, you know, rich task. What about has connections beyond or outside the classroom? It's yes. not just that within the four walls of your classroom, okay? What about things like it connects students with real data about the world? They're actually connecting to live data sets and looking at actual data and measuring things about their real world. Things like it's authentic, speaks to a real audience. So the kids are not just doing things to please the teacher, but they're doing things for a real audience. Maybe they're publishing things to a, to a website or a blog or something, or maybe they're, you know, they're producing things that people outside the classroom will see, even if it's just their parents. Um, it has a clear purpose. It's not just busy work. Kids know when they're doing busy work, right? So, but when kids know that they're doing stuff that matters, everything changes. Um, students have choice and a chance to find their unique voice. So we're not just giving kids a task and saying everybody does the same thing. We're building in something into those tasks for students to be able to, you know, focus on aspects of it that they like or that they're good at. Um, using a variety of different tools and platforms. It's not usually just one tool. It's usually they make something in this and they transfer it to that and they do something with that and they use something with this and they're using a range of tools. And something that's difficult or impossible to do without technology, like if you took the technology away, you, you just couldn't do the task. That's one of the definitions. And finally, that includes the four Cs, this idea of communication, collaboration, creativity, and critical thinking. So those are, you know, I think, hopefully some good characteristics some higher level tasks the redefinitional kind of tasks and what i want you guys to do is to take that list of characteristics and now start to look at the stuff you're doing in term one and saying okay the task i'm doing with i don't know year five is it authentic does it have a real audience are they connecting with real data about the world? How many tools are they using? Does it have a clear purpose for them? Is it a rich task? I want you to really look critically now at the things you've got planned for term one, because I'm sure you've already, you already have a pretty good idea what you're gonna be doing in term one, right? I want you to step back a little bit and look at what you're going to do and start mapping it against these ideas of rich tasks and saying, am I, am I hitting some of these, these goals? Because if you're not, then you're probably not making those things as rich as they could be all right so homework for you if you want to do it you don't have to do it right but what i want you to do is take this lesson design challenge and over the weekend if you want to do it i understand you're all busy and you're still on holiday so if you don't want to do it i get it but i want you to start thinking about one of the things that you will be doing next term and i want you to map it back to this m or r business and how could you modify it to incorporate the four C's, to push it up into the SAMA scale, 
And how could you take what you've currently planned and if, if you can improve it, how would you improve it? Okay, so that's your design challenge. I, I will send this out to you in an email. Um, there's, a, there's a template you can use for doing this uh, that you can work on, but that's the homework. Choose one of your own current activities. How would you rate it currently? Where is it on the SAMA scale currently? How would you modify or reinvent it to be better? What would you change? Consider all those characteristics of a higher level task that I just went through. I'll email them to you. And then in the shared slide deck that I'll give you, I want you to outline your original task on the left and your revised task on the right. So you can compare the two side by side to see, this is what I was gonna do, but look at it now, right? And then if we ask you to, and you're willing to, to prepare to, um, to present that to the group next week. So that's what I'd like you to do. I will send this to you in a follow-up email. So keep your eye open for that. Um, just reminding you that this is continuing on next Monday. We're going to be unpacking some more stuff next Monday. Uh, we'll give you some time to share back the homework, if, you, if hopefully a few of you have done it. Um, Kimberly will be talking to us about AI and education, because obviously that's a really big deal going forward. And uh, where does all that fit in? So we'll be looking at AI very much from an educational lens. Um, and Darren is going to take us through some of the latest updates from Google because there's some really cool stuff that's being uh, unveiled. I don't know if you know, but the BET conference is on in, in London right now as we speak. Um, and we are just about to announce a whole bunch of cool stuff to, um, to Workspace and some other tools. And Darren will take you through those on Monday. I would love it if you could please, please, please go to that address on the screen there, bit.ly slash bts24-feedback or you can scan the QR code on your phone if that's easier for you. And please take just a moment to uh, fill in that feedback form. Um, we really, uh, I cannot overstate the importance of collecting the feedback, both for obviously trying to improve things as we go along, but also just, you know, it helps us do our jobs basically. And the better we can do our jobs, the better we can help you. So if you could do that, we'd really appreciate that. And I'll just leave that on the screen. Um, and if anyone wants to unmute, it is 3.32, so Thank we're you. two minutes over. I can't click on the link. You can't click on the link. Uh, you have to type it in, mate. Uh, so I just put get... in the chat as well. Oh, you put it in the chat. chat. Thanks, Dad. Thank you. Good on you. But thanks, everyone. Yeah, if you could just take a moment to do that. I know we're technically up a couple of minutes over time, so my apologies for that. But hopefully you got something out of today. Thank you. It was great. Thanks, Ms. Thank Roy. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Happy Monday. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Chris. No worries. <laughs>